dear ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming in this hot weather. And we're very glad to welcome uh, Professor Max Cresswell from the University of Victoria, Wellington, New Zealand. And uh, his today's talk is called Semantics and, and Ontology. Uh, we have 40 or 50 minutes for the talk, and then we'll have a session for questions and discussion. Uh, please have this question. Well, let me first thank all of you for being here and letting me come here. I have learned, tried to learn one or two Russian phrases. I, I know Pajansta, and I know Spasebo, and I know Ochen Priyatna. I don't know whether I pronounce them correctly. <laughs> um, but I must always make the apology from an English speaker traveling. We English speakers expect everybody else to know our language, and we don't know anybody else's language. And I always feel very embarrassed when I have to give a talk in a country where the language is not English. So do please, I will try to speak slowly, and I will try to speak as clearly as I can, but if you think I'm not going too fast and want me to repeat anything, just yell out and, and say so. <clears throat> what I have given you is example sentences, and I've given them, since they are English sentences, I've given them to you on the handout. The talk, in a way, is not particularly new. <clears throat> what I'm trying to do is show why philosophers should be interested in the structure of language. If you like, it's why facts about language, facts about the logical structure of language, which are, the, in a way, the business of linguists, these facts have philosophical, if you like, metaphysical implications. So in a way, it's addressed to philosophers why they need to know something about the, the structure of language. The example sentences I'm going to use are from English, but the talk is not really about the structure of English because the things that these English sentences mean are things that people ought to want to say anyway. So that whether a language does it the way English does it, whether a language does it in some completely different way, these are things that people need language to say, and therefore there has got to be an underlying structure to any language which what allows people to say these things there has to be an underlying structure which we can use for the purposes of ontology. And I want to begin by reading to you <coughs> some quotations from a well-known British philosopher, G. E. Moore, who wrote an article in the journal called Mind in 1899. And Moore is talking about the relation between existence and truth. And he says, at one point, it is only maintained that existence is logically subordinate to truth. That's what he's trying to maintain, that existence is logically subordinate to truth. That truth cannot be defined by reference to existence, but existence only by reference to truth. When I say this paper exists, I must require that this proposition be true. And later he says, it is similarly impossible that truth should be depend on a relation to existence or to an existent, since the proposition by which it is so defined must itself be true. And the truth of this can certainly not be established without vicious circle by exhibiting its dependence on an existent. A little later he says, an appeal to facts is useless. For in order that a fact may be made the basis of an argument, it must first be put in the form of a proposition. And moreover, this proposition must be supposed true. So Moore is telling us that if you want to know about ontology, if you want to know about what exists, you have to look at propositions which assert existence 
and look at their truth. And, they, and if you want to look at the logical structure of propositions, the only way in which you can have access to this would seem to be by looking at the logical structure of the languages which express them. And so that is the reason why I want to suggest that the structure of language is important to the metaphysical concerns of philosophers. And as I said, we are not interested here in saying what is the truth about English or about Russian or about any other particular natural language. We are interested in saying any language adequate for communication must be able to say these things. What is the logical structure of a language which can say these things? And in particular, I want to look at some work that I and Adrian Rini have been doing in recent years, and that is looking at the way English, and therefore most natural languages, have to be able to talk about time and have to be able to talk about modality. We have to say that certain things were once the case, or will be the case, or might have been the case. Whether a language has a tense system, as most Indo-European languages do, or whether it expresses temporal distinctions in some different way, we must be able to talk about time, and we must be able to talk about possibilities. <coughs> Looking at another lesson from G.E. Moore, G.E. Moore once gave a very famous lecture called The Proof of an External World. And he said, look, how can I prove that there is an external world? And he held up two hands. He said, I have two hands. Here is one. Here is one. And his point was that the truth of I have two hands must be something that is respected by any semantic theory. There are certain truths, if you like, such that if you deny those truths, then you are denying something which is, in effect, must be more certain than any argument that it's not. So Moore's, Moore point was that, Moore's point was that these obvious truths about the world must be more certain than any philosophical argument against them. And so the technique that I am talking about here is the technique of studying sentences, the structure of sentences, and I will particularly be thinking of sentences about time and modality, and looking at what are the tests from which enable us to go from these ordinary non-philosophical truths to postulating a structure which gives us an ontology which tells us what sort of things have to exist in order to make sense of the logical structure of the things we want to say. Moore's example was sentence one, I have two hands. But we can equally say, I didn't have two hands a hundred years ago. In fact, I didn't even exist a hundred years ago. That's sentence two. Sentence about time. Sentence three, if I had an arm amputated, I would no longer have two hands. That's another sentence here. You might think that there are certain sentences that don't make any reference to time or modality. One might say, sentence four, there is a sideboard to the left of the dining room door at 57 Stanley Avenue, Palmerston, North New Zealand, at 12.20 p.m. New Zealand Standard Time on the 4th of August, 2006. You can see when I was first thinking about these things. You might say that that sentence doesn't have any reference to time and modality. It does, of course, have an explicit date, but you might say there's no modality involved here, and yet, of course, Looking at that sentence four, we have sentence five. Four would still have been true even if I had not been at home then. So even though four itself may not seem to be a modal sentence, it has modal implications because we can make statements about what would have been the case 
that that sentence would still have been true even in certain counterfactual situations. I was, in fact, at home that day. <coughs> we can then move on to sentences about entities that many philosophers will repudiate. I know philosophers who say numbers don't exist. But if you say, do numbers exist, one answer is, but look, surely among the what are called Murian facts, Murian facts are these truths like one that we must always accept. It seems to be a Murian fact that is seven, there is an even number between three and five or eight. There is no way I can jump two meters. And if that's true, if there is an even number between three and five, it looks as though numbers must exist. If you ask, do numbers exist in any other sense, if we follow the philosopher, the philosopher Rudolf Carnap, you would say what you are really asking is, should we adopt a language in which we can speak numerically? And kind of said that's a practical matter, that's, uh, if you like, a uh, pragmatic matter, as he called it. And of course, it's pretty obvious that in order to get by in the world, we do have to adopt such a language. And once we adopt such a language, we get the truth of sentences like seven, from which the truth of a sentence like six to, put to follow. But as I said, I'm really interested in the question of whether times exist, whether other times exist, or if you like, whether other possible worlds exist. Those are questions that bother philosophers. One way in which one might say times obviously exists is to say, well, there is a time at which Socrates drinks hemlock. That's sentence nine. Or one can say, Tim, there is a world in which a detective called Sherlock Holmes lives at 221 Baker Street. These sentences, in a certain sense, could be said to be true, and since they explicitly talk about times and worlds, one might say, well, you can stop your lecture there and go home, because surely these sentences are true and they talk about time, there is a time, there is a world. But there are philosophers who say no. Um, one can say Socrates once drank hemlock or is going to drink hemlock or is now drinking hemlock. One can say that, but one shouldn't actually say there is a time at which. So six would be a misleading way of saying something that should be said using tense operators. My, um, PhD supervisor was a man named Arthur Pryor, and he believed that we shouldn't say there is a time. He believed that we should do everything in what he called a tense language, in which there are operators about it was so, it will be so. And similarly, somebody might say there is a world in which a detective called Sherlock Holmes lives at 221 Baker Street. We shouldn't say that because that is misleading. We can say it might have been so that there is such a detective. So in talking about what the, if you like, what the kind of ontology you get about times and worlds from ordinary language, I don't want to beg any questions by starting to talk about times and worlds. I want to try to look at what kind of a logical structure a language has before we are entitled to say that it quantifies over entities at a certain time. So that we are interested in when a language, in Quine's terms, when a language is committed to certain entities. When there are enough truths in the language, enough obvious truths in the language, so that we can say this language has the structure of quantifiers which range over a domain of things, a domain of entities. So that's what I'm looking at. If we are going to study this, and if our interest is not primarily the study of one particular natural language versus one other particular if it's to be looking at the underlying logical structure of language, then we could do a lot worse than adopt a formal language, adopt one of the languages of formal logic. And let's look at first order predicate logic. And in particular, 
so that we're not going to dig any questions about whether there exists other times or other worlds, let's, for temporal talk, let's have a language in which we have an operator which is called the capital P, which is, which is 12 in your sentence where that P at the beginning means it was once so that, it was once the case that, and F would be it is going to be so, it will one day be so that. <clears throat> but let's look first at an important phenomenon which we can study in a formal language in ways which are much more difficult to study in a natural language. And look at the sentence number 11, a child prodigy studied at this school. It's very difficult to express the ambiguity because a child prodigy is somebody who, as a child, has amazing intellectual capacity. When we say a child prodigy studied at this school, we presumably mean it was once the case, this is sentence 12, it is, was once the case that for some X, X was a child prodigy, but X studied at this school. Because we are probably assuming that the person was a prodigy at the time at which they studied at the school. And that is expressed in 12 by putting both child prodigy and study at the school inside the scope of the operator it was once so, that the past operator, that's why it was called P, a past operator, it was once so that. However, if you look at predicate logic, you can also have uh, sentence 12, sorry, sentence 13. 13 says there is something, there is an X, for those of you who are less familiar with predicate logic, that backwards E, the symbol that Russell used, means there is an X. X is a child prodigy, and it was the case that X studied at the school. Now that's probably unlikely, because if we are talking about a grown person, we might say they once studied at the school, but they're no longer a child prodigy. So, in the sense in which 11 is meant, it probably is to be understood as 12, that it was once the case that for some X, X is a child prodigy and study at the school, whether the being a child prodigy and the studying at the school are things which took place of something at a past, in the past. Right. Rather than uh, there is something, and this something is, child prodigy, and, and if we're using a tensed language, is the, the sentences of the tense language are to be understood as holding now, that was Arthur Pryor's claim, is a child prodigy and studied at the school. But in other sentences, the preferred reading is going to be reversed. Every old man was once a baby. Well, I was once a baby, and I'm an old man now. 75, I'm an old man, and I was once a baby. So 15 is true of me, and it's probably true of every, every old man, every X. If X is now an old man, then sometime in the past X was a baby. But you can't say 16, there was a time in the past at which everyone who was then an old man was then a baby. Because when you're an old man, you're no longer a baby. So we're not talking about being an old man and being a baby at the same time. We're talking about being an old man and then it being true in the past. Similarly, with the future, a child prodigy will study at this school, but also, which is more important, a child prodigy might study at this school. And the reason that many philosophers are interested in what Adrian and I have called the world time parallel is because many philosophers want to say, I'm quite happy to accept that there are other times, but I'm not happy to accept that there are other possible worlds. And part of the argument of this paper is that what we argue should exist, what, what philosophers ought to believe in, should be able to be read off from the logical structure of the way we think, and the logical structure of the way we think can only be read off from the logical structure of the way we talk. And that's why we have to study the logical structure of natural languages. 
Let's look then particularly at what sort of a logical structure will give you quantification. In first order predicate logic, a sentence like 19 will mean for every x, x is happy, which is true if everybody in the what's called domain of discourse is happy. And normally the way you motivate the understanding of the upside down A, which is known as the universal quantifier because it says for every x, every value of x makes x is happy true, which means everything or possibly everyone because we're probably restricting ourselves, we don't say so, restricting ourselves to humans. And people think, in, and you find this in introductory logic books, to understand 19, you say, well, Alice is happy, and Bruce is happy, and Clarissa is happy, and Desmond is happy, and Ernest is happy, and Frederick is happy, and so on. And you make a list of everybody in the world, you give them a name, and because every one of them is happy, we then conclude everyone is happy. But that is possibly a mistake, because you can imagine a sentence about, I don't think I have this on here, but you can imagine a sentence about subatomic particles and saying how every one of them behaves. And nobody is going to suppose that we're going to have a language where we give every one of them a name. So if we want to say, when is a symbol acting like a quantifier, we've got to have some tests for it. Now, in the formal languages we use, it's easy to see because we can, we can establish what a quantifier is, we can say that for all x, x is happy in 19, we know why that's a quantifier because we've stipulated it. But when we meet an ordinary language, the ways you can express 19 are going to be very varied. Somebody told me once that people asked Russell what he thought was the principal defect in the language of Principia Mathematica, and he said he thought it was too much like English. Now, it may be that that is so, but what we can, can be sure of is that if we want to develop tests for quantification in natural language, we can't expect to read them off from the syntax the way we can read it off in the case of formal languages. So, what sort of tests can we have to say that a symbol is a quantification symbol? Well, let's imagine that we have a language in which we've got two symbols, the upside down A and the upside down E. Let's look at some tests, some equivalences that might say, well, if, the, if we have an operator, that little tilde squiggly thing, it just means not. And so 23 says, if everything is not phi, then it's not true that something is phi. So everything is not happy. The whole universe is not happy. So that means it is not so that there exists anything in the universe which is happy. And similarly, if not everything is happy, then there must be something which is not happy. So first of all, we have a pair of operators that are related as 23 and 24 are. Second, that typically, if, everywhere, if everything is happy, then something is happy. Now that's that's a little bit less clear because what if there wasn't anything at all in the universe? So barring that strange possibility, we have 25. We also have some what are called distribution facts. If everything is phi and everything is psi, then everything is both phi and psi. That's 26. If either something is phi or something is psi, that, that the upside down wedge is, is the logical symbol for and, and the wedge is the logical symbol for or. I think it came originally from the Latin well or vel, which meant or, and it means or in logic, as you, most of you, I guess, would know. A or B means A or B, including the possibility of both. So the universal quantifier, we say, distributes over conjunction. Everything is A and everything, if everything is phi and everything is psi, then everything is both. If either something is phi or something is psi, then something is either phi or psi. 
those are equivalences. Then we have implications that horseshoe sign or hook sign means if, if there is something which is both phi and psi, then there is something which is phi and something which is psi. And we used to give examples to show that it doesn't work. In a logic class, you'll say um, some numbers are even, some numbers are odd. From that, it does not follow that any number is both even. But if there is someone who's both happy and in Moscow, then there is someone who's happy and there's someone who's in Moscow. Similarly, um, if you have a universal one, if everything is phi or everything is psi, then everything is one or the other. But it doesn't work in the other way. Every number is odd or even. It doesn't follow that every number is odd. What does follow is if everything is phi and something is psi, so everybody's happy and some people are in Moscow, then there's at least somebody who's happy in Moscow. Everybody's happy and someone's in Moscow, so someone is both happy and in Moscow because whoever's in Moscow will be happy because everybody is, so that, that, that works, and again, it doesn't work. So you've got a whole lot of formulas, you know, I won't go through them all, uh, but they are part of what defines a quantifier. But you'll notice, those of you who know a little bit, bit of logic, will notice that there is something a little peculiar in 23 to 34. I have not used any what are called individual variables. For a certain restricted class of sentences, we don't. If I say everybody which is happy, in standard predicate logic, you would symbolize it like 35. For all x, if x is rich, then x is happy. But of course, you don't really need the x. And that's why I wanted to say, don't, don't get hung up on the connection with names. Don't get hung up on Alice and Bruce. Bruce and Clarissa over as we had before. If you have only a restricted class of sentences, you don't actually need the variables. The X is not really doing any work in 35. But there are quantificational sentences which need more tricks. And these tricks are ones which in logic require what we call individual variables. But in natural language, they almost don't. If you want to say every logician admires a linguist, <coughs> 38 says for all x, if x is a logician, then there is a y such that the y is a linguist and x admires y. So everything in the universe is such that if it happens to be a logician, then there will be a linguist. So if the logician will call logician X, we'll call the linguist Y, and X and Y is Y. But what if I transpose the X and Y at the very end of that formula to get 39 instead of 38? For all X, if X is a logician, then there is a Y such that Y is a logician, and Y admires X. Now, we can't do anything like that in a normal natural language, but what we can do in English is use an operator, which is called passivization. We can say every logician is admired by a linguist. And there are logics, there is a branch of logic, it's called combinatory logic, which has operators which replicate bound variables in a way that is much closer to natural language. The way in natural language, we don't need the x's and y's, but we do need other tricks. We need tricks like passivization. So what we are starting to see here is you, in, in ordinary first order predicate logic, you can read off what entities you believe in from the range of what sort of variables you have quantifying them. And there was a philosopher named W.V. Quine who said, if you want to know what a philosopher is committed to, look at their language when they have formalized it using first order quantification theory and then look at what their variables, the x's and y's, what sorts of things they talk about. 
But of course, you can't do that for natural language, so you have to have other tricks. And the other tricks are that it's not that we can name all the logicians and linguists. Maybe with logicians and linguists we can name them. But if I talk about all numbers, or all points of space, or all atomic particles, or subatomic particles, I can't give them names. So if I'm to talk about them in natural language, I really, the point about the X's and the Y's is not so that we can name things in the universe, it's so that we can express things like the difference between 37 and 40. The difference between 37 and 40 requires that our language be supplemented by these variables. So the first point then is that in order to see how to do ontology, you take your natural language and you say, what kind of tricks do we need in a formal language to replicate the things that can be expressed in the natural language? Now, sometimes you can't do this. I know one particular philosopher in New Zealand who makes great fun of this. He says, look, you can't read off anything. He's a real metaphysician who says, I know what really exists, and I don't have any of this nonsense about reading it off from natural language. Because we say there is a chance of rain, don't we have chances? Or I did it for your sake, don't we have to have sakes in the world? We have to be careful here. If you look in particular, and I would, I would imagine something like this is true in other languages, but in, in English at any rate, sentence 42 is, for somebody's sake, do, I did it for your sake. I did it because I wanted to help you. This is what we call an idiom. And every natural language, I'm sure, has idioms. And it's the mark of an idiom that the noun, the noun sake here can only refer in a very restricted range of environments. You can't say, is your sake the same as mine? That, that how many sakes did you do it for this morning? You, there's such a lot of things you can't use the noun sake for. So that we can say, look, our ontology may not have to admit sakes because sentences about sakes are, are, don't occur in, uh, in enough contexts, in enough environments for us to do anything. Chances are a little bit tricky. You can say, well, there's a better chance of rain than there is of sunshine. Or you could, there are more things you can say about chances, so maybe chances are a bit tricky. There is a... Um, in, in one of the articles I read, it was a, a book by a philosopher named Crispin Wright who was writing about Frege, and he was talking about the whereabouts of the Prime Minister are unknown. So are there whereabouts in the universe? Well, says, look, the whereabouts of the Prime Minister are more certain than the whereabouts of the Chancellor. The, the, so that there are, um, and he thought that there were enough things you could say about whereabouts to suggest there are. I mentioned these in order to say that the question of ontology is a tricky one. What we have to have and what we've got is enough features of the logical structure of the things we want to say to give us something which is equivalent to quantifiers and individual variables. And I want now in the remainder of the talk to go through certain sentences about time. Now, I'm using ink and time and modality. They're English sentences, as I said, but I'm pretty sure that any language, whatever its tense or modal system, I'm pretty sure that any language is going to have to be able to say these things. And the first of them was discovered and studied way, way back in the 1970s. There were two philosophers working at UCLA, writing PhD dissertations with uh, a philosopher named Richard Montague. They were Hans Kamp and Frank Blatt. And they were interested in sentences about tense. And one of their sentences was, one day, everyone now miserable will be happy. And if you take an ordinary tense logic, it clearly, that's 44. That sentence can't mean the same as 45. Because we're not saying there's going to be a time in the future and everybody miserable at that time is happy at that time. We're actually talking about people who are now miserable and will be happy. 
So maybe it's centers like 46. No matter who X may be, if X is miserable, then X will be happy. That's closer. But suppose we're all miserable here today. You're all, you're all stuck here um, uh, listening to me. And I'm miserable because you're miserable. So we're all miserable here. And perhaps we're the only miserable people in the world. But I'm going to be happy tomorrow. Petra's going to be happy the next day. Okay, to the next day. And so on. There's going to be some time for every one of us, there's going to be a day on which we will be happy. But there's not going to be any day on which all of us are going to be happy. You see, 44 doesn't say one day. It, it, what, it, what it says is there will be a time in the future and everybody miserable today is going to be happy at that time. So it can't be made true because I'm going to be happy tomorrow and somebody else is going to be happy the next day and somebody else is going to be happy the day after. It's got to be there's going to be one day at which we're all going to be happy. And that can't be expressed. This is one of the things that um, I was kind of proved a long, long time ago. One of the things which can't be expressed in ordinary propositional, in ordinary uh, predicate tense logic is that sentence 44. And it gets worse. Frank Light pointed out that this is not just about the word now. Because one might have said once everybody then miserable was going to be happy. See, the now, the, the, the first trick was, all right, let's imagine now is some particular moment, and some operators always bring them back to now. And Vlad noted that you didn't, there was also then. Because you can say, it was once the case, some time ago, and we're not saying when, that everybody then miserable was going to be happy. So, so that the only time now comes in is now is, is the point we start off with, and then we go back to some time in the future, and we're talking about what happened to everybody miserable at that time in a time which is future from then. And, of course, you can, in fact, go further. I mean, a, a little bit uh, later, and you can combine them. I mean, there are complex sentences in which you could say, one day, everybody who is now miserable but was... Uh, I, at one point, I had everybody... One day, everybody who is now rich but used to be... It was once the case that everybody now rich but then poor was going to admire everybody who was then rich. So that you, you actually have to keep more than one lot of people involved. And that's important, you see, because the point about sentences like 38 and 39 is that we have individual variables to keep track of who we're talking about. And sometimes, well, you might have two, you might have three, you might have four. There's no natural logical limit. And similarly, if we have words like now and then, it's not just one now and one then. We might have a sentence with one now and lots of things, and we have to keep track of which now and which then we're talking about. We can easily do it if we have quantification over times. So sentence, um, uh, sentences, the uh, once everyone then miserable was going to be happy, that doesn't mean it was once the case that everyone miserable was going to be happy in the future, because for the same reason, it, it, mean, it doesn't mean that it was once so that if one person was miserable then, they were going to be happy, and if another person was miserable then, they were going to be happy, and if another person was miserable then, they were going to be happy. It's that there was going to be a time in which all those people who are miserable there, we're going to be happy. And that's what you can't do with sentences like 50 or 51. What you can do, however, is to have a now operator. And a now operator, it's a weird now operator. In English, the word now always brings you back to the present. But in logic, a now just means whatever moment you happen to be at. So that the, the, the now operator in logic will be in English a now operator when we're talking about the present, we will then operate when we're talking about the past. And if you look at 52, 
I'll go through it very slowly with you. There is a time, and that time is now, and it will be so that at some time in the future, everybody who is miserable at tea, and of course miserable at tea means the time which is now, so you've got, it first says there is a time, that time is now, and it's going to be the case that at some time in the future, all the people who are miserable at tea, now that's not the people who are miserable in the future, that's the people who are miserable now, so there is a time, it's now, call that time tea. Now, we go into the future, and everybody in the future who has the feature miserable at tea, well that means miserable away, is happy. So the happy is inside the scope of the future operator. And so is the actee miserable, but the miserable in 52 is in the scope of the T, and the T is linked to the now. And of course, that will give you that will give you 52. And now let's move down for the moment. We can talk about 53 later, but 54 says, in some time there was a past time. At some time in the past, there is a time, and that time is now. But of course, that's not our now, that's the past now. So it's a, at some time in the past, there was a time that was then the now, and it was going to be true in the future of that time. So we've gone back into the past, we've said there's a time t, and that's the time, that's the t that is now at the past. And from the future of that past time, all the people who are miserable at the tea are going to be happy. Now, you may have to think a bit about these things. The next point is that every single one of these constructions that you can do for tense, you can also do for modality. So everyone actually miserable might have been happy. It doesn't mean every miserable person could have been happy. It means that it's possible that all the miserable people, it's not just that, think of the lottery. Everyone who buys a ticket and loses could have won. But it doesn't follow that it's possible that everybody who bought a ticket it's not possible that everybody who bought a ticket won, but it is possible for everyone who bought a ticket, it's possible that they won. So we're not talking about a possibility that everybody who did something will have something true. We can combine these, and that was the, the sentence, if it had been raining, it would have been possible for everyone in miserable to have been happy. And you can, perhaps I should just leave you to puzzle at that sentence number 60, but it, you can see there we're talking about the, the N means the now, which is time, and the A means the world, which is action. Now again, I'm not able to go through in a talk like this, but what we can prove is that if we have languages with enough operators like the passive operator in English, the reflexive operator, in natural language there are X loves X, we can say X loves themselves, so we have reflexive words in English. And reflexive words are when a two-place relation holds between X and X, the same use the same variable. That's what we do in logic. In English we can have reflexivization. We can have passivization, which turns the order of the operators around. What can be shown is that if you have a language with enough operators to do all the things that the natural language sentences require, then the semantics for those operators enables them to be represented by explicit quantification of the times and explicit quantification of the words. So that if you claim with Quine that what we ought to believe in can be read off from what sorts of things have to be the values of the individual variables in your representation of a natural language. If you can, if you can, if, if the things you have to say in natural language can only be represented in a formal language which has explicit quantification, then your language is committed to these sorts of things. 
And that is the reason why I'm saying, as I've said, this is really addressed in a way to philosophers because it's saying, come on philosophers. Linguists can perhaps say, I don't know anything about metaphysics. Emin Bach used to have what he called natural language metaphysics. He says, I don't care about what really exists. I only care about what our language claims exists. Well, he's a linguist. He doesn't have to do this. I'm a philosopher, and I want to say, look, guys, maybe when you do metaphysics, all you have got to go on is the logical structure of language. And if you want to know what your ontology has to be, you've got to look at the underlying logical structure of language, you've got to look at the things we want to say, and you've got to look at what kind of a formal logical language is needed. And one of the byproducts is going to be, at least, um, I mean, that's the general claim I'm making in the talk. The specific claim is I try to illustrate it by looking at ways in which the language of tense or the language of time distinctions, I don't want to say tense because tense is perhaps a syntactic category, the language of time distinctions and the language of modal distinctions are going to be such that you are going to have a logical parallel here, and in both cases it looks as though the things we want to say in natural language demand that we quantify over these things. Metaphysicians of some kind of say, oh, but I don't think they really exist. Well, I'm prepared to give them it, metaphysicians that really exist. And I'll say, well, if you have some distinction between really exists, that's fine. You go away and use really exists. I'm only interested in what can be said to exist in some natural sense. And I believe that the way to look at that is to look at the underlying logical structure of natural language. Thank you very much.